On with us is the one, the only, Dr. Glenn Boyce, Chancellor at the University of Mississippi. Good morning, sir. How are uh, you? Doing well, Paul. Good morning. Thank you for having me on. Uh, it's been a long time. I know you're a busy guy. We try to reach out every once in a while, and uh, the mic is always there for you. And before we leave today, I want to make sure you uh, you cover everything that you have, because I know there's a lot of things going on. But as far as classes are concerned, what's the status of that? Uh, we're, we're opening up today, Paul. You hit, hit me on the first day of classes, and we're excited. And uh, we've got one of our largest enrollments ever, and certainly our freshman mm. class will be the largest class we've ever enrolled. And, uh, we're excited about that, and we're excited about all the young people and the vibrancy that's back on campus right now. Wow. So this will be the largest freshman class in uh, ever? Ever at this point in time. We haven't completed all the enrollment numbers, and they'll be released a little bit later in the fall. But And the percentage of increase uh, is set a new record as well, which surpassed last year's freshman class, which was the largest percentage increase in our history. So the vibrancy is here, and the trajectory is here, and it's exciting. And uh, one of the things that I'm especially excited about is that we've grown in the number of in-state Mississippians by 43% over the last two years in our freshman class. So the number of in-state students has actually increased then? It, yes, about it's that? increasing. For all numbers, we have 200 more yep. or so than we had last year. So we're excited. We're excited about <laughs> all the trajectory for enrollment and where we're headed. Uh, a lot of it in overall enrollment will be up as well simply because uh, our retention rates are incredible. Our freshman class intent, uh, retention yeah. rates for the last two years, uh, 88% one year and 89% the other year. It's truly amazing. Uh, you know, there, there is a, a story, and I think you'll be interested in this one, too, that kind of plays in, uh, into this as far as the overall concept of, of, um, of education. And I know in your previous position, too. But we got word over the, over the weekend with some good news. Mississippi student test scores are exceeding pre-pandemic levels in two subjects after a decline in the previous years, according to the Department of Education. Statewide results from the 2120 Mississippi Academic Assessment Program shows a boost in the test scores for English, language arts, and uh, science. Percentage of the students scoring proficient or advanced reach what the department said is an all-time high at 42.2% in English, 55.9% in science, uh, and the Mississippi Academic Assessment Program measures students' achievements, four subjects, math, English, science, and history. We got a little more work to do. We were about 4% fewer students overall past the math, but uh, they're working on that. So it, it's good news when you see that the, the pandemic, um, the results of that pandemic are evening out a little bit. Your thoughts on that? Yeah, I was with the, the governor the other night, and I was listening to him talk about our K-12 statistics, and it was exciting. It was exciting to hear what our graduation yep. rates were and had the increase, and exponentially, Mississippi has jumped up the ladder across our nation in K-12 education, and uh, we're certainly excited by it because it just means that as the students come here, their foundations are better prepared, and that's one of the reasons that we're going to continue to have high retention rates, and uh, our graduation rates will increase as well, and these students have gone to wonderful careers and jobs. So it is incredibly exciting any time you have those kind of statistics come out of K-12 education, and it gives us the opportunity to do even more here. But boys, anything that the uh, students or, or the um, uh, parents need to know as far as any changes on, on campus uh, that, that I'm not sure parking or whatever, there are a lot of changes always during a school year, uh -huh. but are any changes that you want to mention? Uh, really, really, Paul, there's not a lot. Um, we are Good. we are taking on uh, managing COVID well. Our students have done a great job, and we won't be changing much there. We always follow the CDC guidelines and so on. Uh, I think of, as of this morning, we had uh, perhaps like 19 cases, so we're handling that well. Uh, perhaps the only changes that I can mention is that we have a new electronic parking system, uh, and that's about it. And, you know, students have parking tickets, so... Uh, they, they need to be careful because we actually have a system that uh, that will track the cars uh, electronically to a point. Oh, in other words, so it's going to be harder to get out of a ticket is basically <laughs> what you're saying. A little bit harder to get out of a ticket these days, maybe. So who knows? Wow, wow. So there you go. No, no excuses uh, at all. 
I, I do have a couple of things that I do want to ask you. <clears throat> the, uh, the the marijuana program, the research program there, has been doing the same thing for quite a while, and it's noted as one of the very few, the only one at, at one particular time. Since the legalization of uh, medical marijuana in our state, has has that program changed, pivoted in any way? What's what's the status of that? Um, the program the program has set up a new center to work with the state and to work with mm-hmm. uh, any kind of new changes that come down right now in the cannabis industry. And I can tell you that as the cannabis industry moves to indoor growing and gets a lot more sophisticated uh, with the controlled inside environments, uh, we will do the same. You know, for years you saw the fields and you saw so much of the, the marijuana that was grown outside and so on and so forth. And yes, we are the preeminent without question uh, cannabis discovery and research people in America. There's no doubt about that. We've been at this a long, long time. Yeah. But the changes, that, the changes that will evolve will primarily evolve as part of that new center that we've developed in order to help the state work through the process of legalization uh, as we move forward with different types of medical issues and research. And mm-hmm. a big part of that, of course, will be moving into uh, the inside and growing and controlling the environment. You, you look at the medical center, that aspect of Ole Miss, and you also look at uh, the the research facility there. And I'm not sure, are, are there some universities that d- have developed a business curriculum or medical curriculum around the, the legalization of marijuana? I couldn't answer that, Paul, at this point in time, yeah. but I'm pretty certain that if they haven't, they're on their way to, to achieving yeah. this or yeah. working toward that. There's no question about it because... Obviously, the industry is already very, very large and will continue to grow through the years without question. You, do you think that's something Ole Miss would do or maybe a university in our state? I think that's something that the, the Cannabis Center uh, will talk about because, of course, it's, it's run out of our pharmaceutical school, and our pharmacy school is one of the mm-hmm. finest in all the country. So if there's any cutting-edge work that can be done or any programming work that will be done, it'll come out of that school, and, and that school yeah. does a tremendous job. It's one of the finest in the nation. I do want to switch to gears here and talk about this. So there's some kind of announcement that's going to be happening this week, according to the administration on student loans from the administration on payments. The payments are, I think, at the end of the month uh, scheduled to resume. They've been on hiatus for a while. And, and during this entire debate, sometimes we don't hear so much from the universities. Do you have any thoughts on, on this whole issue of forgiving uh, these uh, these uh, my understanding is a little complicated, but if you have a federal loan, apparently that is applicable. But if you have a, a state loan or a private loan, it's not. So I'm not sure where this stands. Well, I have to tell you, Paul, that it's a major concern of ours and always will be is to the cost of higher education because it mm-hmm. is expensive. And um, we have an awful lot of students who are working jobs, two jobs, in order to put themselves through this institution. We recognize that. So we do everything we possibly can to keep costs down. And I will tell you, Paul, the U.S. News and World Report last year ranked our university as 31st uh, public university for value in the country. And we were very, very excited about that. That's in the top 5%. So we're always, we're always mindful of the cost of higher education, and we do everything we can to keep it as minimal as possible, knowing that our students are gonna come out with debt loads. And those debt loads will not allow them to access the economy as quickly as we'd like for them to access it. So, and as far as loan forgiveness, uh, I really can't comment to it, Paul. We issued $83 million, I believe, last week of support for our students in the various loan and scholarship packages that we have at this university in order to help them uh, make it through the year. Here, here's a rhetorical question when we come back. Uh, has there been any meetings or any discussion on NIL as the football season <laughs> gets closer and closer? I think we had a conversation with Dr. R- uh, uh, Professor Richlack uh, not too long ago. Back with more with Dr. Glenn Boyce, Chancellor of Ole Miss. I smell pigskin in the air, my friends. Back with more coming up next. Later, Dr. Glenn Boyce, Chancellor at the University of Mississippi. Update in the university, and, the, and the, one more time for the emphasis here. Now, this uh, you know, if somebody's asking me, could you explain the electric parking meters thing one more time? <laughs> uh, it's just, a, it's just a, it's a, it's a system that we had, we we put in place over the summer, 
And it just simply is where, you know, in the past, uh, an individual would have to walk down through and ticket cars and so on and so forth. And now we have an electronic system that allows us to just drive on down through and uh, ticket cars or not ticket cars and make I got sure you. keep our park correctly. I think you came in on, oops, I better hear this one again uh, on the ceasefire text line, so I uh, wanted to make sure. No, we were we were talking about the NIL, and I know there were a lot of meetings going on, and this thing is kind of in chaos. It's it's almost taken the side note as fantasy football. It's a, it's a whole new spectrum of sports that we didn't have a few years ago. But you're, as the chancellor of Ole Miss, your, your insight and analysis of this. Well, Paul, let me first say that college athletics is changing rapidly, and it's uh, much larger than even NIL. And I, I think that's the part that is so challenging and so difficult is all of the changes that are unfolding right now all at one time and the, the, how quickly college athletics and the issues are changing. One of the things that we're excited about, of course, is our athletic success at Ole Miss. And, you know, we have a national championship baseball program. And, you know, but also – we, uh, we finished 20th in the Learfield Director Cup standings, which is a rankings uh, that is done of over 300 Division I athletic programs in America. So our overall program is an amazing program. It's a very, very strong program. We're excited about that. The SEC had nine teams in the tw- top 25 of that. And, of course, we were one of them at 20th, which was a new standard and a new record for us as well. And one of the things, too, that I want to mention is that our graduation success with our student athletes is amazing. Their fall overall GPA last year was 3.02 for about 400 and some athletes and 3.04 in the spring. Graduation success rate jumped up to a new record at 88% in the latest uh, graduation success rate. So we truly have a student athlete program that's not only achieving amazing things on the field of play, but in the classroom as well and are great examples. And as college athletics changes, our challenge is to continue this kind of trajectory, to continue this kind of competitiveness within this environment that candidly, Paul, is going to require an awful lot more resources and uh, a different approach to success. But I know you guys have a lot of meetings during the summer, and you, you talk to your cohorts at different universities, certainly in the SEC. But is there a is there is there a consensus that everybody needs to come together on this NIL and and how, is that going to be done through some working relationship with the NCAA or through the legislative process a process in Congress? Um, it's probably going to be done through the legislative process in Congress if it can be achieved. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the difficulty, Paul, and we have spent hours. Uh, with my colleagues. I've spent hours discussing this issue. And much as you've said, the difficulty is where can we find enough um, commonality between conferences, between different parts of the nation, uh, Mm -hmm. between even in the legislatures uh, within the states, as each state has their own own NIL laws. Where can we find that kind of commonality to bring us all together to have a standardized set of NIL? Very, very complicated. Uh, probably won't be done unless it's done through Congress. Was in those meetings, is there a rumbling? Because you even hear people saying, uh, look, forget about the NCAA. Is there rumblings of that within the, the, the conference and within the, the Southeastern Conference? Well, I think, I think Paul, that, well, I can't comment to specifically, but uh, is to, quote, unquote, being done with the NCAA. I think the NCAA certainly has a role within college athletics like it always has. But I do think mm-hmm. that there is significant change coming to the NCAA. And I think as, as college athletics changes, the NCAA knows that they are also are going to have to change in order to take and uh, match up to what modern day athletics is demanding and the changes that are coming about so quickly. And that's part mm-hmm. of the issue, Paul. And by the way, some of those changes are, are through the legalities and the court system across America as well. And so those are some of the major issues going on, too. You you alluded to the uh, being the home of the College World Series champions of the world. How has that been uh, over the summer? Uh, that's so exciting, Paul. What can you say? You know, everything that can be said uh, has been said, and, and, yeah, and yeah. you know, and it should be. Coach Bianco, the coaching staff, the athletes. Uh, what what a great representation of this university. And you know, Paul, over one point six million people turned out to see that, uh, you know, NCAA 
World Championship, quote unquote, College World Series. And I have to tell you that when you have that kind of exposure with the team and the way they played and with our great school of colors and our fan base out there in mass taking over Omaha and that stadium, look, that's the kind of visibility that this university is just taking us to a brand new trajectory. And you can't even imagine the number of visitors that come up to, to visit us nowadays to consider this university. It is an amazing, uh, become an amazing place in terms of just how we handle the number of visitors we have and the number of students yeah. who are considering us these days. America's most beautiful I, I campus. Yeah, I, I don't think there is uh, ever been in any state, certainly two years, uh, holding the World uh, Series championship. Any state has uh, generated more excitement about baseball at the college level uh, in the in the in this country than uh, we have in the state of Mississippi. Uh, one other thing, and I, and I know we don't have a lot of time left, but one of the parts of universities, uh, and we know because we we do a lot of remotes there sometimes, that people take for granted sometimes and just don't pay attention to, is the amount of research grants that go on. And boy, they affect our life, not only here in our state, but nationwide, from agriculture to industry, to aeronautics to workforce development. And it's, it's one of the great things about having, uh, you know, great universities in our state. But give me a second to speak to that, certainly as it relates to Ole Miss. Uh, you said it perfectly. And uh, our research efforts at Ole Miss just continue to uh, climb and continue to become uh, more important, I think, to our economy and what one of the things that I'm committed to is figuring out how we take and do the tech transfer and how we take and ensure that the research that our, our researchers are doing here is turned successfully into free enterprise and we get that enterprise out across the state to expand and work with our economy and to give more jobs and uh, you know more career opportunities to our graduates and keep them at home which is a priority of mine and I can tell you right now very quickly that I am working on a, one of the bills that just was passed in Congress, a regional technology hub, uh, which will be a significant effort if we can acquire this. And thanks to Senator Wicker's hard work, we really have a, a real opportunity here in Mississippi to bring a regional technology hub to our state along with our corresponding states around that we're working with to put this yep. together. It would be a significant transformative uh, effort on the part of us and a part of our research divisions. And so we're excited about what the future might hold for these kind of efforts to help our state. Right. Before I let you go, any we talked about changes on the campus, but anything, uh, any changes or anything as far as when the first her, a home game happens, because uh, football's around the corner. Well, no, but I will say this. Well, this is the 60th year of James Meredith uh, integrating our university, and we're very, very excited mm -hmm. to bring James and Judy back and to celebrate this highlight for this man whose story and whose, whose impact has led thousands of African-American students across our graduation stages, making enormous differences in their lives out there across America that we're so proud of. So we are really, really excited to celebrate the, the James and Judy this fall. Dr. Boyce, I've had the opportunity to interview him, I think twice, maybe three times, I think it's twice. And uh, it's been a while back, but the guy punch, pulls no punches. He, he, he doesn't change. He tells you just like it is, doesn't he? And wonderful gentleman. What a history. I can assure you. I've got to what know him over the last few years. It's great. Wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Sir, always any final thoughts here before we let you go? Uh, the only final thought I have, Paul, is this: the trajectory of this university is just running sky high. We're excited about what's going on here. We're excited about this upcoming year and what we're going to be able to achieve and what our faculty and our, our students and all this and our staff, they're just, they're absolutely wonderful people. It's a great place to live your life, Paul. Yeah, and congratulations again on a record number of uh, freshman students coming in, as you said. Dr. Glenn Boyce, always a pleasure, sir. Thank you for taking the time on this Monday. We look forward Thank to talking to you.